Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. This is an hour devoted to learning something more, not just about the world we live in, but about how, what, and why we think and believe as we do. An hour for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to eldentaylor.com forward slash chat. So, Ravinder, say hello to the folks and let us all know about your chat room today. Well, hello, everyone. It's lovely being with you today. The chat room is up, and the chat room is so popular, we are getting demands to have the chat room start earlier uh, each week as well. So I could well be doing that because we have some marvelous conversation. The only one missing is you. So come join us at eldentaylor.com forward slash chat. Now you have an after chat also. I mean, while you're talking about starting it early, you have an after chat and that's a by invitation only. That's correct. There's an after chat group um, on Facebook. So all you have to do is friend either Eldon or myself and, you know, asked to be added to the after chat group and you can come join us there and you know in the after chat group we carry on the conversation about you know whatever the topic was on the air and we add our thoughts and it's really cool stuff your archive of the chat is also available so if someone is tuning in to the show later and a replay during this week they can also access the chat log And see the conversation as it went on. And many times you'll have your guests. Some of our guests will actually enter the chat room, especially during break, and take comments, etc. So it's really worth paying attention to. It most certainly is. Okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show was all about the science behind mediumship, and Dr. Julie Beischel of the Winbridge Institute was our guest. Angela wrote, great show today. Mark wrote, a little birdie told me to listen to the show today on mediumship. I'm glad I did. Thank you, Eldon, and guest Dr. Julie Beischel for the enjoyable discussion. I also enjoyed the chat room as always. Brian commented, it was a fast-paced chat today. It will be interesting to see how Dr. B's research continues in this vein and what will be discovered. You know... Everyone seems to just love your chat room. What's the magic spell you have going on in there, Rav? It's just an amazing group of people. That's it. I mean, yeah, I mean, they often say you can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. Well, here we have the best of the best out there. You know, talk about like-minded people. They're open. Um, They all have some amazing insights. It's just a good group. And when I look at the chat log, it is a very powerful group as well. You've got some keen intellectuals in there. We do. Tom wrote, years ago in L.A., I did a show on Powers of the Mind for KTTV, Channel 11. I was also president of the Society for Psychical Research, which was run mostly by scientists, of which I was not one. We did a lot of research on those claiming to be psychic. Most of those claiming to be were either self-deluding or frauds. However... There were some striking exceptions, about 7% that had genuine abilities. I also taught a course on mind power and intuition at UCLA's Experimental College, where we had some real success showing average people how to tap into their intuition. So it's not all failure in that realm, but people have to be cautious when consulting with those claiming such powers. Well, amen to that, Tom. Shelley added, I believe it is the same as finding a good doctor, dentist, mechanic, hairstylist, minister, teacher, etc. Some are not credible and some are. Lydia added, I very much enjoyed hearing your interview with Dr. Baishul. I am strongly considering transferring some of my doctoral credits and applying to Saybrook's program where she teaches. And your interview was very timely and full of great points to consider. You are clearly well-versed and knowledgeable about the topic as well. I'm glad I came across your show, and we'll be sure to keep listening in the future. Well, we hope you do that, and best of luck, Lydia. Thanks for your feedback. Moving on, Tony wrote, Your site is amazing, and the speaker, Eldon Taylor, is awesome. I like that. Thank you, Tony. Cornish wrote, InterTalk is brilliant. It really works, and I have experienced changes in my life. JJ wrote, You have thanked us for our support and kind words. 
But truly, it is us who owe you a thank you for what you have done for us, the people. If you were saying mindless things, we would not be there or listen to you. But you don't. You are informative, helpful, human, and fascinating to listen to because what you say is real. Just the facts, the truth, and for that I want to say thank you, Eldon Taylor. I can't say it enough, nor do I think any of us can. Well, you know, not much I can say to that, J.J., other than thanks. And so uh, thank you very much, sir. Candy wrote, Inner Talk has been so valuable to me in my life, I don't know what I or my family would have done without it. Thank you for your marvelous technology. Jeremy wrote, I can't offer enough kudos to you for what you have done for me and my children. Your Inner Talk programs rock, my friend. Thank you. I like that. They rock. (laughs) Martha wrote, I've lost weight, gained self-esteem, found a good job, saved some money, and got out of debt and gain control of my former addictive patterns and all of this thanks to InterTalk. Please let Dr. Taylor know how thankful I am to him for all of his teachings and particularly for his InterTalk programs. Well, Martha, you just did let me know and thank you for your feedback and support. Gina wrote, I have suffered three to four losses in a year and a half. I don't know if I should count one of them. I was promised a job promotion that would have meant security for me. A new selfish human to our company came along, and I didn't get it because he put his buddy in the job. Two were deaths. One of my three-year-old granddaughter, the other death was a friend, and then my lover and promised to be husband left me for another woman. I couldn't stand the pain but stayed strong for my daughter and to work. I cried out to the angels to help me. I couldn't even afford a counselor, no health insurance. All of a sudden, a thought came to my head. I found you and your free MP3s. I will listen every day until I am healed of this broken heart. Thank you so very much. Well, we're saddened to hear of your trials, Gina. We we do wish you the very best going forward and appreciate sincerely you sharing. Now, Gina is speaking of our free InterTalk MP3 programs that we make available as just a part of our own pay-it-forward efforts. You can get yours as well by simply going to intertalk.com and choosing free programs from the left-hand navigation pane. The programs are not samples. They are the real deal, the patented and scientifically proven effective InterTalk technology. So, you know, act now. You're entitled. I mean, you truly are entitled to your very best you today. All right, that's all the time we have for letters, but I do invite you to opine by sending your email to Eldon at eldentaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. We can't get all of your letters on the air, but they do impact our programming. And once again, I both appreciate and thank you for your feedback and support. Now to today's show, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers with Annie Kagan. When William Cohen, a.k.a. Billy Fingers, woke his sister Annie at dawn after his death, she thought she was dreaming. Now, Annie Kagan is not a medium or a psychic. She did not die and come back to life. In fact, when she was awakened by her deceased brother, she thought perhaps she had gone a little crazy. In her book, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers, How My Bad Boy Brother Proved to Me There's Life After Death, Annie shares the extraordinary story of her after-death communication with her brother Billy, who began speaking to her just weeks after his unexpected death. Her copy reads, quote, This is one of the most detailed and profound after-death communications ever recorded. Annie Kagan's book takes the reader beyond the near-death experience and Billy's vivid, real-time account of his ongoing journey through the mysteries of death may change the way you think about life, death, and your place in the universe, close quote. Okay, a little about Dr. Annie Kagan. She began writing songs at the age of 14. She was signed by a producer from Columbia Records. At 16, she was performing in New York City cafes and clubs. After 10 years as a songwriter and performer, Annie returned to college, graduating with honors, and became a doctor of chiropractic with a successful private practice on Manhattan's Upper East Side. Attracted to Eastern spiritual traditions, Annie studied yoga and pursued an intense meditation practice. Following her inner voice, she left her career as a doctor and abandoned her hectic city life in search of serenity in a small house by the bay on the tip of Long Island. 
and he returned to songwriting, collaborating with Grammy and Emmy Award-winning producer Brian Keene. Brian's high regard for her lyrics inspired Annie to join a writer's workshop. While writing her first novel, her brother Billy died unexpectedly and began speaking to her from the afterlife. So, with that, let's get her in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Dr. Annie Kagan. Hello. What a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you today. Oh, well, thank you very much. You know, I, I'm at your website, um, and I and I happened to look at your media, and, and I found it really interesting that last night you were on KTKK AM out of Salt Lake City, Utah, as a guest. This is the station that I first did my first radio show on. And now, is that synchronistic or is that just coincidence, Annie? That's synchronistic, and uh, I feel very much um, very pleased to be speaking with you, especially pleased to be speaking with you. And I, I don't really know why, but I just have this wonderful feeling about the conversation to come. Well, that's great. You know, I have the same feeling. And I, I think in your words, or maybe your brother's words, it would be the music of the moment. It's the music of the moment. And it's uh, also an openness that I feel and an opening of consciousness that I feel. Let's begin this way, if we may. Please, you know, share the story of how your brother came to you how you initially responded both to the event and to the information he was attempting to share with you. Yes, well, three weeks after my brother's death, he was uh, hit by a car and killed. I was extremely grief-stricken, and it was dawn, really, and I was just waking up, and I heard his voice very clearly coming from above me as if there was a hole in the ceiling and he was calling my name and he was saying Annie Annie it's me it's Billy get up and I thought that I was still dreaming and I said Billy I must be dreaming because you're dead you can't be here and he said no I'm here get up get out of bed get a notebook And as I stepped on the floor and went to get the notebook and a pen, I realized that I wasn't dreaming. And the first thing that he did was he comforted me and told me that there was nothing cruel for him, that he was drifting through a beautiful, divine universe, and the lights were nurturing him, healing him, and that death was really amazing, that it couldn't be better, really, and that he promised me that we would meet again. And while he was talking to me, the atmosphere of where he was flowed into me, and instead of feeling grief-stricken, I now felt very euphoric and very peaceful. Did you question it all? Um, you're, you, I mean, it would be natural. The psychologist in me, you know, has to say this. It would be natural to want to have these feelings, to want to have that communication. And, and, and the more grief we are driven by, the more inclined we are to find means and ways of healing ourselves. So did did you question at all this process as, you know, I guess, bottom line, how did you distinguish it from a fiction of your own mind? Yeah, Eldon, that's a great question because that's exactly what I thought. I thought, I must be manufacturing this to make myself feel better. Somehow I am creating this. And the interesting thing was Billy knew that. And the next time that he came to visit, he said, you know, I know that you think this is your imagination, so I'm going to prove to you that I am real. This is not your imagination, and this is really happening. And he did. He proved to me over and over again. 
by giving me what are called evidentiary after-death communications, which means that he gave me information that I couldn't possibly know that proved to be correct over and over again. But even while he was doing that, my mind had an almost impossible time accepting that this was really happening to me. And so I would go back and forth between questioning and accepting, and after a while of so much proof, I decided that this had to be happening, this had to be real, and that was the only reason that I agreed to publish the book, because otherwise I couldn't be sure if it was just my own fantasy. Sure, sure. And, and I think we would, I mean, naturally, we would all be in that same place. Can you give us an example of the kind of evidentiary information that he provided you? I can. Um, well, this one w- was a lot of fun. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't tell very many people about my experience. And I had a friend text. She was one of the few people who knew. And One day I'm making lunch. This was maybe a month and a half into my communications with him. And all of a sudden I hear Billy's voice in my kitchen telling me to call Tex and say, show me the money. So, of course, I'm pretty hesitant, but Tex has a good sense of humor. And I call Tex and I say, I know this sounds crazy, but Billy says, show me the money. What does that mean? And she starts laughing, and she says that that very morning she was walking her dogs at the beach, and she looked up at the sky, and she said, Billy, if you're real, please give me a sign. And she comes home, takes a shower, and after her shower, she starts looking at herself in the mirror, drying herself off with a towel, and thinking about her screenplay, she's dancing around saying, show me the money, show me the money, show me the money. And she gets out of the shower, and I call her, and I say, Billy says, show me the money. <laughs> That's so too that good. was pretty That's... amusing. Yeah, yeah, I say so. There really is. How, yeah, no, I guess a two-part question here. How long did it take you to download the information uh, from your brother that's in the book, and are you are you still continuing to have communications? Yeah, the book happened over a period of about two and a half to three years, and I'm definitely still having communications. And one of the interesting things is that there are many births and deaths on the other side, The other side is a place of great transformation. So sometimes I won't hear from Billy for quite a while, and then he'll come back in a slightly different form. So it's all about evolution and change. Wow. I mean, is there there any kind of withdrawal when he's gone and you have these extended periods and you're not sure then if he's coming back? At first, there was a feeling of loss, although it was never the same kind of feeling as when he died, because I knew that he still existed, even though I wasn't able to contact him. But now I just know that he's off somewhere, and um, I'm much more detached about it, and I know he'll be back, and I know that he's on his journey, and I know that he's eternal, and I know that we're all eternal, including now. We're not just eternal after we go through the door of death. We are divine, eternal beings right now. Let me let me ask you this. You're, you were you know, a doctor of chiropractic. You had a successful practice. You lost your brother. Uh, your brother begins to come through, yes. uh, and, and suddenly we have a career change as well. Uh, you give up your chiropractic practice, and you go back to writing music. Uh, tell us how that transition, I mean, was that prompted because of, uh, of what Billy, what he was telling you, or was that... Uh, well, it was the know, other just... way around, actually. I... Um... 
I feel it was kind of a, the hand of destiny where I had a wonderful practice and um, after several years, I began to find that working with my patients who I was very involved with, I was not a distant kind of doctor. I had a lot of love for my patients and I found that that was almost a hindrance in that I began to become very affected by working with people in pain. And so I began a very serious meditation practice to try to remedy the situation. But the interesting side effect in my case was that I became hypersensitive and now my feelings increased my feeling of absorption of energy, and I began to feel that living in the heart of New York City with the pace and the noise just became too much for me. And even though I was quite frightened, I sold my practice, I sold uh, what I owned in the city, and I just wanted to be alone. And I bought a very small secluded house by the bay, and I really had no idea what I was going to do next, and I had no idea that my life was really setting the stage for a great adventure to come. Interesting, interesting. I want to I want to get to the messages in the book, but I have one more question about your brother before we go to the messages. Yes. You, uh, your subtitle, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers, subtitle, How My Bad Boy Brother Proved to Me There's Life After Death. Why do you call him a bad boy? <laughs> yes. Well, Billy was my older brother, and uh, much of his life he had a romance with alcohol and drugs. And I was always the good girl, the good student, the one who played by the rules. And even though I call Billy my bad boy brother, I mean it also in a clamorous way because I always looked up to him. He was a really free spirit. He loved life. He loved people. And he had fun. So in a way, some of the messages that he's bringing to me from the other side they're bad boy messages. They're a little bit rebellious. And I think they've helped me to loosen up a bit and just enjoy my life a lot more. That's really, I mean, that, that goes to the core of the issue. You know, uh, your brother is communicating with you. Let's assume that that's accepted as a given. Okay. What What gives rise to you believing that everything he communicates is as it really is? That's a really good question. I think because it's so soothing and healing, and when I put it into practice, it makes my life so much better. Of course, at first, not only was I skeptical that somebody is talking to me from another dimension and I could hear them, I think anybody would have doubts. But on top of it, it's, it's my bad boy brother who really didn't do very well at life. And um, in the book, I explained that I, I actually had a lot of fear because it was him. And why should I be doing what he's telling me to do? Actually, I should be running in the other direction. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what I've concluded it now is that I think his difficulties in life made him very, very wise. And I think one of the comforting things is that so many people have so many struggles, and people feel bad about their struggles. And one of the messages of the book is, you know, maybe your struggles are what is going to make you a wiser being, and maybe you've chosen your struggles, as Billy says, he I'm going to chose- ask you to hold it right there, mm-hmm. if you will, Dr. Kagan. We have a hard break coming ahead of us. We're speaking with Dr. Annie Kagan about her book, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers. You'll want to read this one. If you're not already in our chat room, now is a great time to join in the conversation. We have a short movie for you during the break, so be sure to log into eldentaylor.com forward slash chat. Do stay tuned. You don't want to miss what's coming up after a few words from some of our friends.
Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. And welcome back. If you just joined us, we're speaking with Dr. Annie Kagan about her book, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers. But before we get back to the show, I do want to invite you to join me on Facebook as a friend or a fan. I post regularly everything from where I am and what's on next to the latest in science, technology, and consciousness studies. And from time to time, I've been known to rant some with my own opinions about the world we live in. I also want to remind you to be sure and register to receive my free newsletter when you visit my site and get your free MP3. All right, before the break, we were discussing some empowering words that your brother had given you, actually, that that when you tried them on and you used them in life, they just they worked really well. But I have to stop you right there, if I may, Dr. Kagan, because it occurred to me that your bad boy brother is checking out your friend Tex while she's in the shower doing her show me the money. So he's still kind of a bad boy. He is still kind of a bad boy. He's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely still a bad boy. And, uh, he's, he's very funny and his wisdom has a lot of street cred in it. It's very relatable and it makes, uh, Sometimes people say that, you know, he puts words to things that they've always felt inside of them but didn't have words for. And when they hear a word, it kind of becomes an experience for them. I mean, we're talking here now, but I could never convey really the light that Billy's words have because, after all, I'm still here. I, I think your book does a marvelous job at that, by the way, for what it's worth. And we, we're going to get into that. But I, I have to ask this. You know, we've had a couple of guests. And one that comes to my mind is a Dr. Ga- uh, Dr. Stoller, whose son Galen Stoller crossed over. And he had it, it was because of deep grief that he believed that his boy came to him and began to share with him what the afterlife was like. And, and of course, you mentioned, you know, your own grieving process. The question is, you know, why did Billy come to you? Why did he choose to come to you? I mean, what is it that causes some people to come through that curtain and communicate with loved ones when, you know, by numbers, so many hundreds of millions do not? Two answers to that question. One of the one of the uh, treasure hunts that Billy sent me on. Uh, had me discover journals that he wrote towards the end of his life. And I was astounded when I read in his journals that what he really wanted to do was write a spiritual book that would help people and please God, because he would write all of these entries to God, please help him find a way to do that. And, you know, after he died, he he laughed and said, boy, I never thought I'd become an author posthumously. (laughs) So I believe that it was, this is Billy's job, and that's why this communication is so detailed. In terms Mm. of people communicating, the, the astounding figures are that one in four people have after-death communications in our society. This is not really such an odd thing, but there is not a lot of support for that kind of thing. And I encourage people, I think one of the purposes of, of the book is to have people open their minds to all the different kinds of ways that people from the other side reach out, because people reach out in order to comfort us, because according to Billy, once you're on the other side, you're really okay, you're in a world of bliss. But we hear, we we grieve, and we miss them. And no matter how deeply we grieve, when we know for sure that they still exist and that we will meet them again, there's a tremendous amount of comfort in, in that knowing. Interesting, interesting. Now, I, I guess part of me says, uh, based on what you're saying, I need to be sure that I remember to be careful what I ask for, huh? Uh, if you want to write a spiritual book, you want to add in this lifetime. I uh, think, yeah, you might want. I think he actually <laughs> prefers to do it from where he is because he certainly he does. Okay, yeah, he's certainly uh, having a party. 
I'm going to want you to tell us now. Let's let's get into some of the things he talks about because some of the things, you know, some people, um, those traditional Orthodox uh, born agains may well think what are a bit irrelevant, irre- irreverent. I'll get the word out. Yes. Uh, Billy talks about a hologram. Uh, on page 45 of your book, and I'm quoting, he says, By the way, after you die, when you watch your hologram, you get to see everything. Who loved you, who hated you, what they did for you, and what they did to you when your back was turned. Unpack this for us. What what, what does he mean by a hologram, and what did he learn? Billy had several different life reviews. It's different than with someone having an, a near-death experience because that person is coming back. Billy's not coming back. And so you're referring to his very first life review and he's viewing his life around him like a movie and it's a hologram and he could look wherever he wants. Also what's really wonderful is he says he gets to live out all the lives that he didn't live. So, for example, if you had a first love and you didn't marry them, you get to marry them and see what that would have been like. And you get to have different professions. And what I love that he says in his bad boy way is that, you know, at a certain point, the hologram disappears because he realizes that being in the present moment where he is floating in this divine universe is a lot more interesting than looking back at the life that he left behind. You know, I find that particularly interesting because of the work of men like uh, David Bohm, uh, David Peet, uh, you know, in a holographic universe, Talbot, uh, yes. the whole notion that we live in a holographic universe and, and, of course, you uh, have indicated a great interest in Eastern teachings, and so you're going to be familiar with the notion of the illusion that we supposedly live in. Do you think it's possible that there are holographs within holographs, that indeed we are only living out uh, in some dimension a possibility, and there are many of those possibilities operating in many dimensions simultaneously? I definitely think that, and I definitely think that that's what Billy got to experience. He says, you know, there's there's like a computer chip that records everything that we go through, Um, but it's always all about the moment. And also another uh, wonderful thing that he says in his bad boy way when he talks about quantum leaps, he says, you know, one of the things that he's taught me is how important our perspective is in life and how powerful it is. And he gives an example, a funny example. He calls it uh, Billy's version of Schrodinger's cat because Schrodinger's cat is is a, a quantum experiment. And he says, you know, just think about a cat who's living with daddy because my father didn't like cats. Mm -hmm. And just think about a cat who's living with me because I love cats. Do you think that might affect the cat? Of course it would affect the cat. So the way that you see something actually changes that something. And that's one of the most beautiful things I've learned from Billy is change my viewpoint in order to you know, see life in a way that's, that, that serves me and assists me and is beautiful for me because I have control over my viewpoint. And in this world, in science, we call that the Pygmalion or the expectation factor, and it uh, always uh, bears truth. You're, Billy says this. He says, how do I know my life wasn't some punish for, punishment for my past transgressions? Well, because there is no such thing. You're not on earth to be punished. It's not about sin and punishment. I don't want to finish this. I'll let you unpack it. (laughs) What do you mean, life without sin or punishment? Right. You picked the most controversial uh, sentence in the whole book because what I've learned is that it's extremely 
controversial to say that divine consciousness is better than than human consciousness, that the divine is all-loving and all-forgiving, and the divine is involved in healing, not punishing. That is a very controversial thing to say. Because we on earth want to feel that if you do something, quote, wrong, you are going to be punished later on. But according to Billy, divine consciousness is so kind and compassionate and understanding that it feels that its job is to heal what is sick in us and punishment doesn't do that. So now to be provocative and, and to Provo- pursue your controversy, <laughs> uh, we have uh, holographs on the other side, and somewhere there we've got, you know, Mengele and, and um, Hitler, and, and they're living these holographs as well. And what if they had done better things? But there is no punishment. They are just, uh, they're just going through the life review of all the people they stuck in the back. Is that the, is that the notion? Well, I'm not saying there isn't education, but this, this idea of eternal damnation, if you think about it, and later in the book, Billy talks about the fact that really we're all one. And on the other side, that's, that's a fact. That's not just opinion. That's not just um, a spiritual thing that we teach each other so that we'll be kind to each other. But you see the light, the same light in everything. And so if one person is eternally damned, well, then in a way we all are because we're all part of that being. So it's hard for me to understand with my own human consciousness. I'm just reporting, you know, what Billy is what Billy is telling me. And but perfectly I, so. And, yeah. and I love it. I mean, you just anticipate my next question. Yes. So now here we are. We're all one, right? Yeah. But Billy says, even though I don't have my body anymore, I do still feel like an individual. So much for disappearing into the sea of bliss, <laughs> the oneness dispelled in a stroke of the pen. You want to flesh that one out for us? Yeah, well, he says that early on. <laughs> he does. He you know, does. He goes, see, he goes through different changes. And um, the first time that he does dip into the sea of bliss, he calls it becoming the universe. So after his first life review, he has an encounter with, with a light being who blesses him, and he starts, his identity begins to dissolve. And this is, I think, one of the things we all fear about death. But as he's dissolving and, and as, I'm, as he's dictating, it's taken forever because each word is separated and separated. So it was it was it was a very long dictation. And he's saying, Annie, but you don't understand when you lose your identity, it feels so good. You really don't care. You're happy to lose your identity because you're blending into this cosmic bliss, and you're becoming more and more divine. And then what happens? After he loses his identity, he reconstitutes, and he's again a self, but now he's a self with more divine qualities, that, that he's a higher being, and he, he likens this state to human sleeping because he lets go, he blends into the cosmos, and then he comes back. He's still Billy, but a better version. You know, I, I, I wish this show were a three-hour show. You know, we need <laughs> at least too. two hours because I'd love to just continue. I have got so many more questions for you here, but we have callers and questions out of the chat room. So I'm going to give them a chance today. Uh, we're going to go to the phones now, and we'll talk to Susanna out of Sedona, Arizona. Uh, Susanna, you have a question for Dr. Kagan. Yes, thank you so much for taking my call today. It's uh, of course. a wonderful conversation. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Kagan, I, I really, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I would find the answer if I read the book, which I probably will get the book. Um, yeah. but, it is know, a great like, book. You yeah, are a you. student of the Eastern traditions, and, you know, my take on Eastern traditions is that there's this concept of, um, you know, karma, you know, that, <laughs> that we kind oh, of yes. um, reincarnate on Earth, you know, yes. it's like that we're trying to get it right, and is, is, is that, uh, is that what yeah. Billy, uh, confirms as well? Yeah, another another uh, really controversial uh, issue. Billy mm-hmm. says that karma is not what we think it is. It's not, I do this to you, so then you do this to me. He debunks the whole thing. He says, you know, we sign up to do this dance together before we're born, but it's really not, that doesn't have anything to do with vengeance or punishment it's more a wonderful exploration of wisdom that we've decided to do this dance together once again it's not it's not a punishment and also i think that um what's very interesting a conclusion that i've come to is that you know somehow that we think that if we don't have all these rules and and fears that something terrible is going to happen to us if we're not good, that somehow we're going to be terrible. But actually, if you connect with your divine soul, you just are good and loving. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I've learned from Billy. It's not just about rules and regulations. It's about connecting with our true light and our true love, which is real and much more real than the shadow element. All right. Thank you for your call, Susanna. Thank you. You know, before we take another phone call here, um, how do you deal personally with uh, tragedies that we see in the world? Um, The Boston Marathon, take that for example. That's current news. Um, You know, it, it may be fine theoretically metaphysically to to suggest that you know if we live or if we connect uh to our divine selves there is no need for a uh, penal system there is no need but oh, no, but no, how no, do I'm you not, i'm not saying that at all we definitely okay please flesh that out we need that on this level i i would never ever say that all i'm saying to you is that when we as seekers, as spiritual seekers, connect with love, we, we fill the universe with that. I've had conversations with someone you probably know, um, Scarlett Lewis, mm-hmm. whose, whose son was, was killed uh, in, in Connecticut. And she's on a campaign to have people replace their violent, hateful thoughts with beautiful thoughts. And and yes. she has suffered the greatest loss of all, the loss of her, her beloved son. So I would say that that's kind of more what I'm speaking of. Not that we shouldn't have jails or punishment or... That's not what I mean. I mean... Other- right, no, and, and I didn't mean that you intended to mean that either. What I was asking is... You know, how you personally deal with that when you see these kinds of tragedies? Do you are you able to extend that love uh, to the perpetrators, or, or do you do you have? I mean, look, I spent years as a criminalist, and I still, as much as I may want to believe, um, I still can recoil when I see venomous actions against innocent people. Yes, that's very difficult for me. And I, you of too. course, oh yeah, especially, if, you know, one of my causes is I just, it just destroys me when I see people being cruel to animals. That, that's something that me I'm too. kind of not able to forgive. But um, I'm a human being and I'm supposed to have all these emotions. I'm not supposed to be, I, I, I'm not divine consciousness. And that's another point that Billy makes is that we're supposed to have all kinds of feelings in this place, and we're supposed to accept those feelings. And so, 
you know, I'll tell you an interesting story about uh, somebody told me that somebody who was on death row was reading Billy. He was about to be executed, and he was reading Billy's book. Mm -hmm. And so how do I feel about that? I don't know. But I'm not supposed to be divine consciousness. I'm just supposed to consider the fact that I, that there's something greater than I am. There's, there, there's um, yeah. a greater... So much of the mystery uh, is the suspense. There's no question about that. Let's take another phone call, since I promised we would. <laughs> Let's go to Bill in Chicago, Illinois. Bill, welcome to Provocative Enlightenment. You have a question for Dr. Kagan, and please, we're short time. Okay, I just wanted to say that I used to believe in near-death experiences in a previous life. So, yeah, the question... I have is, how did it go over when you first told your friends about these experiences? I'm really interested in that. You know, because my friends know me very well, I only got support. Wow, um, that's incredible. Because I'm such a scientific person that um, the first person I told was my husband, and I said, God, do you think it's a grief? Making me crazy, he says, no, 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 people don't go crazy all of a sudden. Just send me the dictation and let me look at it. So I've had enormous support. Well, that's amazing. You're an exception, I would say. I think most people, when they share these things, they get incredible resistance at first. That's totally true, and that's why we have a little community on my Facebook page where everybody's sharing their experiences and other people are saying, yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you for the surprising answer. Thanks for the call, Bill. All right. Listen, while you're on that subject, and to make sure that we get it done, Annie, uh, please tell everybody about your website, um, where they can find your book, how they can learn more about you, and so forth. Sure. Um, Website, Afterlife of Billy Fingers. Free chapter on the website. Um, Facebook page, Afterlife of Billy Fingers. Great page, lots of Billy wisdom, lots of people talking about this subject. Uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, bookstores everywhere. And um, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. Oh, and I'm not going to let you go yet. I've got the best question for last, but you only get (laughs) like 30 seconds to answer it. What was the most surprising bit of information Billy gave you? The most surprising, wonderful thing was that every single cell in our body has been made on a star, and the same intelligence that runs the universe beats our hearts and breathes our breath. And if we just remember that, we're going to have a much more beautiful life. Much healthier life on that. The book is The Afterlife of Billy Fingers, How My Bad Boy Brother Proved to Me There's Life After Death. You know, sometimes I read books and and I tell you, you know, this was enjoyable, etc. I'm going to tell you that this is a book I recommend. It's a fun book. Uh, It's going to challenge you. I think for all intent and purposes, uh, it may challenge you more than you want to be challenged. But it makes some very powerful points. And so my challenge to you would be, Get the afterlife of Billy Fingers, accept the challenge, see how you process it. All right. We've come to the end of another hour of provocative enlightenment. I want to thank the team at Hay House Radio for making what we do on this show so pleasurable. And, of course, thank you. Um, A big thank you, I should say, to our guests and to all of you for joining us today. How about thanking you, Ravinder? I appreciate your participation as well. Listen, if you have comments, please let us know. And until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters.